Hey, what's up, guys? You watching or listening to the Grey App podcast, depending on where we're streaming this. We're outside the foundry, right? The foundry, right. building in Cape Town, Greenpoint. And I have Zachary and George here. Hi, how are you doing? All good. Uh, and we're having another exciting podcast here. So I think let's start with you introducing yourself for, for folks who do not know what you're all about. Sure. My name is Zachary George, Zach for short. I've been in South Africa now for just over nine years. Uh, currently, I run or I'm the co-founder of Startup Bootcamp Africa, which is the one of the largest multi-corporate backed accelerators for early stage tech startups on the African continent. Uh, I'm also one of the most active angel investors in pan-African technology startups covering financial services, insurance, retail, e-commerce, big data, health tech, and, ed, and, and yeah. uh, ed tech. Um, in my prior life, I was, uh, for my sins, I was a Wall Street banker. So I was um, an investment banker covering M&A, uh, traditional coverage banking, and uh, equity and debt capital markets for about seven years. That was at Lehman Brothers in New York, and then Post the bankruptcy of Lehman, I was at Barclays Capital. So, funny enough, although I was a banker for many years, my background is actually engineering. So, I was uh, a mechanical engineer by trade. Mm. And then, after getting my MBA from Stanford in 2004, 2005, is when I moved over to banking. So, yeah, it's been an, been an interesting journey so far. But my, my sort of current and long term commitment is to working to build the future of innovation on the African continent by investing and accelerating right. the founders of African tech startups. So before we get into your African experience and your connection to Africa, um, I know you are the, a member of, of Mensa. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. I used to be obsessed with that stuff when I was younger. So You still should be. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I you actually have my Mensa card with me too. Okay, well, <laughs> what, what, I, what, I, what happened to happen was that I wanted to go write the, the exams. I wrote to the association. Yeah. And then I realized that, oh, actually, you have to pay to participate in the exam. And then I couldn't afford it at the time. So it just slipped off me. Like, hey, you know. How much does it mean? It shouldn't cost a lot. So, so the thing with Mensa is, I think when I wrote it, it, would, it was 2004 or 2005, and it cost like maybe $50 or something. So it yeah. wasn't too much money but maybe it's gone up a lot now since no then. no that was back like way back so oh, way I, back. I couldn't even afford the 50 bucks at the time <laughs> got it yeah yeah um so what does that entail really mensa is touted well it is a network of it's called the global high iq society but it essentially judges it tests you on three things it tests you in a combination of your analytical reasoning and your logic um your comprehension ability so how can you disseminate um, short pieces of information in paragraphs through stories or s sentence structures and um, make observations and inferences from the data given to you. Uh, and, and obviously Mensa to a large extent is attests your logical, mathematical and reasoning ability mm -hmm. and, uh, and, 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 and your ability to work with shapes, um, sizes, geometry, angles, brain teasers and, and, and reasoning mm -hmm. logic so yeah. it's it's an IQ test um, the thing about Mensa which is an interesting fact is if you don't score in the top 2% of the test um, you can't retake the test mm -hmm. until a 5 or 10 year period yeah. I think it's a 5 year period so it's a pretty risky test to take. Mm -hmm. So if you don't <laughs> succeed, then you have to wait for five years to take it again. So uh, I think I took the Mensa test in 2004 when I was 22 years old. Right. So <laughs> luckily I passed and got into You, you might want to not take it for the next 10 years. So yeah, so I don't need to. <laughs> so I don't need to anymore. So once you get in, you get in. Oh, okay. um, yeah, and, the, and then the, the membership is transferable. So I was part of uh, American Mensa for many years. And then when I moved here nine years ago, I just transferred mm -hmm. to South Africa. So it's a, it's a really cool club. And what is your, what are your roots? Where are you from exactly? Yeah, so my, 
my father was so my connection to Africa is multifold. My father was actually born in Dar es Salaam in Tanzania. Uh, he lived there till he was a teenager and then uh, moved to the south of India, in a small state called Kerala. So my father is from the south of India. Um, my mother's family is also from uh, well, my, my mother's roots go back to Persia, so Iran. But they settled in the south of India a couple of generations ago. So technically, I'm mixed. Um, I grew up in the Middle East in a small country called Oman, okay. which is uh, the capital of which is Muscat, which is where I grew up. And Muscat is about an hour's flight from Dubai. Most of you know where Dubai is. Yeah. So I spent most of my childhood, 16 years of my life, growing up, growing up in Muscat, um, a very sort of expat. Um, lifestyle yeah middle class expat lifestyle and uh, moved to India for the first time when I was 17 years old and got my undergrad in mechanical engineering from it's called the Indian Institute of Technology which is um, like it, it, it's 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 the it's the Indian version of MIT but on steroids so right. it's um, just some of the smartest engineers entrepreneurs scientists um, come from these universities. There are five of them. Mm -hmm. uh, Satya Nadella, the CEO of Microsoft, Sundar Pariachi, the CEO of Google, and a lot of the heads of engineering and a lot of the top folks, Indian Americans in Silicon Valley, mm -hmm. have come from the school. So I was very lucky and privileged. They have a less than 0.5% acceptance rate. So I was very lucky to have gotten into it. Um, but never really felt a pull towards engineering. Mm -hmm. uh, I would consider myself a geek when I grew up, uh, most, through, most of it through school, but I didn't really feel that I was cut out to be um, working in the confines of an office or institution or a research center or a lab. Mm -hmm. um, so I very quickly pivoted, pivoted out of engineering and moved into business at Stanford in California, which one of the best schools in the world. Actually, arguably, what the best two years of my life. And what is your percep uh, perception on it? There's an Peter Thiel's theory. That did, did you thought of it as an investment, a consumable good, or a two-year party? <laughs> yeah, so I was at Stanford for, for, for a year and a half. Stanford's an incredible school. It's um, one of the most diverse schools from a geographical and nationality standpoint. A lot of the students that go to Stanford Business School and graduate schools of engineering and science come from all over the world. Um, the network that Stanford has, especially being one of two universities that's very close to Silicon Valley at Stanford and Berkeley, mm -hmm. is incredible. So, you know, most most founders, sorry, most students that get into Stanford Business School or graduate school um, tend to be very entrepreneurial in their mindset. Mm -hmm. And this is even back in 2003 when I got into Stanford. Mm -hmm. Uh, most business schools and higher school uh, and, and, and higher uh, schools of higher education from a, from a postgraduate degree tend to focus on or tend to have tracks where graduates leave and either join consulting firms or banks or large corporations or go into academia. Mm -hmm. Stanford was one school where it's it's within the DNA of the university to be entrepreneurial. So the majority of students end up going and either starting their own companies or joining startups. Mm -hmm. So even in 2004, when I graduated, 2004, 2005, the culture of entrepreneurship was very much baked into the DNA of you know, the university. Now, unfortunately, when I graduated, I had a big student loan to pay off. Right. So I couldn't be going and um, Take risks, you know, taking right. a risk of working at a startup and getting paid a couple of thousand dollars a month. So. I ended up doing the conventional thing and uh, I, I went and worked for a Wall Street firm called Lehman Brothers, which oh, is now very okay. famous or infamous, should I say. Um, but you know, it was a way um, for me to help just pay off my loans very quickly. And as most people know, bankers get, you know, they work, they work a lot, but you also get paid well. So. Um, I've always liked business. I've, 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 I've loved public speaking my entire life. Mm -hmm. In school, I was you know, part of my debate, elocution team. I love, I've loved public speaking and performing mm -hmm. most of my life. I'm also a musician. Okay. So I've been singing for the last 
since I was 15. So I'm 37 now for the last 22 years. So, um, you know, getting a master's degree in finance and business just prepares you for a very f client facing, forward facing role. Mm -hmm. Um, hence the reason why I shifted out of engineering to finance. And working on Wall Street gives you the, op uh, the opportunity mm -hmm. to do that. And there's nothing more client-facing than being an investment banker where you're talking to clients every day. Right. Um, do you think uh, business is something that can be taught? Or in other words, when you go to business school, what exactly do you learn? Because I, I probably have a bias because I'm a dropout myself. But I'm always curious, like, what is it that you learn? You learn how to do business or... What, 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 what's, what do you think one would miss by not attending business school? Yeah, so a lot of people ask me this question because I happen to be privileged enough to go to two very good schools. One, an engineering school in India called the IIT, and then the other one, Stanford, um, for finance. Um, in today's world, I do not think business school, from a pure content perspective, mm. business schools cannot teach you anything that you couldn't otherwise learn from a course online. Mm. Um, in th you know, things like Udemy, Coursera, um, I mean, uh, Get Smarter, which is a South African company. Yeah. Uh, a lot of top business schools now make their courses available for free through mm -hmm. Creative Commons. So MIT and Stanford allow their coursework to be used and read and learned by students anywhere all over the world. If not for free, then at pretty much very basic minimal prices, throwaway prices. Yeah. Um, but what business school really gives you is a network of alumni par excellence. Mm -hmm. Now, if you were to go to one of the top 10 business schools in the world, so your Harvard, your Stanford, Wharton, MIT, Yale, or in Europe, you're looking at you know Oxford, Cambridge, NCAD, you know, IES and similar schools in India or other parts of Asia. Um, it's a network of alumni yeah. um, that will remain with you forever. That will help you not just in from a work perspective, so finding jobs and partnerships, but also once you're in a company, um, getting deals, getting partners, getting mentors, advisors, investors, funding. Uh, it's it's you know the business school network. Right. Especially if it's a top, sort of top 50 global business school. Yeah. So I wouldn't recommend folks that, are, that want to consider business school purely from a content perspective. Mm -hmm. It's not the best use of your money. But from a network perspective, it carries a lot of weight. Um, so I would almost go out on a limb saying, if you have the choice of getting into a non-top tier business school um, versus studying content yourself, I'd say, don't bother. Mm -hmm. But if it's a top 50 business school, go sure. for it. Yeah. Awesome. It's, the, the networks are everywhere. Uh, how long did it take you to, to pay back the, the loan? Uh, <laughs> yeah, it, uh, three years. Okay. In three years. In banking, were, that's good. Yeah, I remember this was 2000. I, I joined Lehman in 2000 and in, in the 04, 05 year. Mm. Um, this was before the crash. Yeah. The crash happened in 08. So pre-crash, those three or four years were good years. Bankers got paid. I mean, listen, I was, you know, uh, a senior analyst. I wasn't, you know, middle management at all. But even as a, a young banker, I joined banking when I was 22. You got paid well. Mm -hmm. You know, so if you weren't, if you were careful with your money, so the way banking works is, you get paid a decent base salary, but the real upside is the bonus at the end of the year. Mm -hmm. So if you know how to live, I, I worked in New York City, so if you know how to not party too hard in New York City, you can save almost your entire bonus and use that to pay off your loan. So I, yeah. that, that's what I did. So at the end of my third year, I had my loans paid off. And so how was the, the Wall Street life? The Wolf of Wall Street? No. <laughs> No, it was it was it was it was really good. Um, it isn't as bad as what the movies make it out to be. I think that's what what you what you saw in the movie Wall Street and the and the Wolf of Wall Street was probably more indicative of the eighties and nineties. Right. In the two thousands, post things like Sarbanes Oxley and a lot of SEC regulations tapping down on bankers 
and their extravagances, um, it wasn't that bad. That being said, Wall Street life can be quite an old boys club, sadly. Uh, there are a lot of egos uh, that come into play. There's a lot of uh, false and foolish pride mm -hmm. that comes into your classic Wall Street um, life. Um, people take pride in things like working all-nighters, yeah. working two all-nighters in a row, and uh, doing things that normal people that have healthy, well-respected lives wouldn't do. Mm -hmm. um, the one thing I would say is working on Wall Street prepares you for almost anything that you would face in the business world. You will right. face clients that are demanding, bosses that are um, very you know, micromanaging bosses, bosses that expect you know, 10 times more than what a normal human being would, would expect. They would expect you to work crazy hours. Um, very, very, depending on what sector of the bank you work in, uh, incredibly complex financial modeling skills, absolutely no margin for error from a presentation standpoint, uh, your dictum, your sophistication, the way you dress, the way you look, the way you talk. So Wall Street is an incredible grooming school for, for making finished products mm -hmm. out of men and women. Right. Um, and I think for that reason alone, even though it is a cutthroat environment, I would recommend anyone mm -hmm. out at university to go and spend two or three years working at a top tier bank or an asset management firm. And if you can, go where it starts. So New York or London or Hong Kong or Mumbai. Uh, but if you're talking Wall Street, Wall Street, there's nothing like the Big Apple. <laughs> right. And um, it just makes you, it makes you a confident human being. And there's no, there's, there's very little room mm. for slackers. There's very little room for weak people. Right. I, I can imagine. Um, so, so again, it's not for everyone. If you were to ask me personally, do I feel that I am built and it's in my DNA or in my heart and soul to be a Wall Street banker? The answer is no. Right. But I knew that I was doing it for a certain number of years to get experience mm. that would put me at a far higher playing field than anyone else. So a lot of people in Wall Street, uh, they actually admit that they want to make more money. So you can see the behaviors that you, you explained here are the attitudes that you get from people that are explicitly mostly want to make money. Was that your, your forte at the time? Like, you're like, I want to make a ton of money and go... Yeah, I mean, so within, within banking, sorry, so within Wall Street, within an investment bank, you have roughly, there are lots of divisions, but there, there are about five different types of roles that you're looking at. The roles that most people outside of the industry see are traders and bankers. Yes. But there really are a lot more. You, broadly speaking, very broadly speaking, you've got traders, investment bankers, research analysts, people in the capital market side. Mm -hmm. um, and then I would put another category as sort of other. The um, engineers and all that. There are, yeah, there are you know, quants, there are engineers. Yeah, and, and, and it sort of support services, right? Marketing, sales, you name it. Um, for the most part, I mean, everyone who works in Wall Street, whether, whether they admit it or not, is fundamentally motivated to some degree mm -hmm. by money. Um, and, I don't, and, and that should never be seen as a negative attribute. The question is, money all that motivates you? Mm -hmm. If money is the only thing that motivates you, that I think is a fundamental problem in your in, in, in your psyche and your long-term goals because if you are motivated by a vision or a belief that you can make the world a better place or safer place a healthier place a more prosperous place through whatever you do mm -hmm. be it healthcare agriculture financial services commerce education money becomes a byproduct of it that is a lot that's that's that, that is a uh, a better way of looking at a career versus just saying, 
I'm motivated by money and nothing else. And usually the more successful and significant people on this planet tend to be ones that were motivated by vision and dreams yes. than just money. The ones that were just motivated by money tend to have, all else being equal, tend to fall away after the first few years yes. and, and burn out. Right. And uh, that's just my experience that I've that I Did you left Lehman Brothers after the crash? Or what happened there? Yeah, so I left Lehman in 2008. I mean, not just me, everyone left Lehman. We were forced to leave. And I was one of the few lucky, I wouldn't say lucky, I actually deserved it. Uh, Barclays um, took about 20 to 25% of Lehman bankers uh, were poached by Barclays. And so I was at Barclays as an assistant vice president for two years. And in 2010, I came to South Africa to watch the World Cup and decided to stay. I fell in love with the country, the people, the opportunity, and the fact that there was very little venture capital in Africa, on the continent of Africa in 2010. Almost, I mean, it was it was Look, barely 10 to $15 million. I was then. young when the crash happened. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I, I can recall a lot of changes, like my dad lost his job and stuff like that. Yeah. But what, what was it like? How did it feel? Um, Gosh, it was it was it was pretty bad. Um, and considering that you just came out of school from Stanford and went to long, uh, Wall yeah, Street. so I'd worked at Wall Street for five years, yeah. from two thousand four till two thousand and eight. Well, five years, including both years when the crash happened. So mm -hmm. I think we had some some information of what was going on, but we didn't know until Sunday evening, September twenty second. Mm -hmm that uh sorry so, um september i forget day the day it was the first week of september that this would happen mm. so it was um it was a shock to all of us and none of us and it it, it wasn't just lehman it was the entire financial services industry it was yeah. jp morgan it was morgan stanley it was goldman sachs it was blood there was blood on the streets yeah metaphorically speaking the reason i ask that question is for people who uh, for, for, for a lot of millennials who have never gone through that or you know they were young when it happened yeah. now they're in the business environment or they're working now what are the changes that you immediately notice in the world what actually happened I think it was a blessing in disguise the crisis happening because it it for the very first time so just to let people know the housing crisis was the the first sort of um, uh, impetus that or the first domino that toppled. So sorry, before that, it was the auto crisis. Mm -hmm. There was a big crisis in the auto industry, which then led to a subprime mortgage crisis, which essentially means that the the housing industry for below prime uh, borrowers collapsed, and a combination of the auto crisis and the subprime mortgage crisis eventually led to a lot of banks that had exposure to subprime real estate portfolios being unable to service those um, those loans and then have to declare eventually bankruptcy. Um, Lehman was one of them and uh, well the biggest one there were several others that were acquired um, in the process. I mean the most the second most famous one being Merrill Lynch that was sold to Bank of America, uh, Washington Mutual, Wachovia, there's a lot of other banks. And of course, similar things happened in across the pond in, in, in Europe, for example. So it was a pretty tumultuous time, mm. but it was a it was a good and necessary evil, because until then, the housing market just going kept going up and up and up and up. Bankers got got paid a lot of money. Uh, deals were being done that were not entirely morally ethical, um, for the sake of making a fee. Yeah. And then when the crisis happened, it was a very good reality check for people to say, at some point, this has to stop. So even though I was part of it, I will, I will always be grateful in a certain way that the crisis actually happened yeah. because it taught people the importance of um, too much greed. And it taught me, even though it happened you know, nearly 11 years ago, that... It is important to always know where, where you stand as an individual, as a person, 
and for your head, heart, and your soul to be aligned right. is extremely important. So it was, it was, it, it was pretty horrible from a financial repercussions perspective, but I think it was necessary. Right. Uh, and nothing, there's nothing to say that a similar thing will not happen again. Right. The stock market crashed, the economy tanked, but it, you know, it, it recovered. Two years later, so yeah, so that was uh, that was the crash. And so another thing, in the sense, I'm into crypto and stuff. I've been really interested in uh, in money and finance, economics. Even though essentially I used to be kind of a, an almost anti macroeconomic, so it used to be called a super micro. Now you know I've been studying macroeconomics for some time. And what are your opinions on banking in, in the theory of lending? You know, printing money out of, thin, out of thin air and stuff. Uh, and what would the world look like if we had hard currency, for example? What would that look like? If we had hard currency? Yeah, like say, gold back instead of fiat money. Yeah, I mean, that's a tricky one. I mean, my, my dad's an economist. He was the chief economist for the Reserve Bank of Oman for 42 years. So that's, I can give you his perspective or I can give you my perspective. Um, I think it was Bill Gates who said this. I'm not sure if it's attributed to him or he, or if he actually said this. He said this a few years ago where he said the world needs banking, but it doesn't necessarily need banks. So my take on that, I mean, I, mean, I've, I now work in the venture capital industry. Like I said, I run tech accelerator programs for um, startups all across Africa, and I'm a huge fan of fintechs. Yeah. Um, in fact, a lot of my portfolio personally and through Startup Bootcamp are fintech companies. Um, I think it is important to understand that you can't entirely be anti-banks or entirely you know, against anything for that matter. Mm -hmm. Simply because banks exist for a reason. Banks have been around for hundreds of years. Hundreds and hundreds of years. Starting off hundreds of years as savings clubs deposit making institutions to commercial banks to retail banking to wealth and investment banking to corporate investment banking so banks serve a very important part in the flow of money mm -hmm. in a country in on a continent on on our planet what what banking does not do too well is the increasing amount of regulation compliance um, fiduciary requirements which are which you know every discerning citizen would understand are important from a security and compliance perspective yeah but in today's world and I hate to say this because I'm sure everyone gives examples of this but they give it for a reason you know in an industry like um, the travel industry and the accommodation and hospitality industry where you know the large in, in, entrenched hotels have now been taken out by Airbnb and the large and en en entrenched transportation taxi industry has been taken out by, by Uber and yep. other similar ride sharing companies. There's a similar trend that's been around for the last 10 years where, you know, a lot of young, not just millennials, but even zenelios, whatever that word is, mm. don't really understand the need for formalized banking products or insurance policies, be it long-term short-term property and casual content insurance and you know the concept of do i need to have a pension plan an annuity a retirement policy the way people think has changed a lot in the last 10 years so as a result you see a lot of fintech insurtech and big data startups that are that are bypassing the need for formal banking products and insurance products and using fintechs yeah so whereas as little as five years ago, take Africa for example, people would still be sending money through wire transfers or through Western Union or MoneyGram. People are now doing it through fintechs. Yeah. Uh, it's the same thing with uh, with insurance products. People are able to insure goods through peer-to-peer -peer insurance companies like Pineapple in South Africa or Lemonade in the UK. People are able to do peer-to-peer -peer lending through social lending platforms. There are alternative credit scoring models versus traditional 
uh, marvels that, that the, the bureaus like TransUnion and, and Experian provide. So we're in a world where we're using technology, the sharing economy, the internet of things to do things that defy traditional brick and mortar institutions. And banking has been or has been in the process of being disrupted for many years. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at the US, for example, um, banks do not control uh, the financial services economy as they do on the African continent. You okay. know, companies like PayPal and Venmo, Cash App, Cash App, there are a whole bunch of things that, you know, young millennials are just not using traditional banks anymore. I mean, and, and to your point, with the, with the uh, you know, growth of the crypto industry, um, not just from, you know, a, 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 the traditional coins like Bitcoin, Ethereum and, um, you know, um, Ether and all the other coins out there. It's just, you know, young folks are tired of business as usual and they're looking at fintechs as a way that suits their lifestyle be uh, better. And, and I've always said this before, if you can make a process cheaper, quicker, or less expensive, and, and more comfortable, mm -hmm. people will gravitate towards that. So if you, can, if you can book accommodation in two taps of your phone, book a car in two taps of your phone, why do you have to fill out policy documents for a bank or for an insurance policy? And if you can opt out whenever you want. So whenever you want. One, one or so, so, so it's important to know that you can't completely get rid of banks mm -hmm. or insurance companies because from a distribution standpoint and a, uh, a channel standpoint, they still control a lot of the volume in our industry. Yeah. So what's important is how do you get startups and the founders of startups to understand how they can work with banks and insurance companies versus working against them. Because working against banks or insurance companies or retailers, it's not going to help you. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, you still need them. Of course. Yeah. You know, from, I mean, you need someone with a financial service license to write you a policy. Exactly. You need someone with a banking, uh, an FSP or a credit provider to issue you credit. But where fintechs and insurtechs work is they help in things like better KYC, quicker ways of onboarding you, quick, quicker ways of getting customers um, to have their claims paid out, right. or more efficient ways of, um, of having your products and service delivered to you. So it's understanding what is the bare minimum that you need from a bank or an insurance company, I'm talking financial services, and what can you outsource or have done through technology? Right. And that's where the holy grail and mix is. Another, I think we should get into what you're doing now in terms of startup, uh, startup bootcamp. How did this come together? Yeah, so Startup Bootcamp was launched about seven years ago. Um, well, eight years ago in 2011 uh, in Amsterdam and in Copenhagen. You know, I came to South Africa in 2010 and saw a, a VC industry that was fairly nascent. And I figured, you know, why go back and be a banker, an investment banker in New York City when I can try and do something radically different mm -hmm. and pioneer an industry, the venture capital industry, an impact investing industry in Africa yeah. based out of Cape Town. And that was a decision I made. And um, so, say you decide to do that, how does it work from there? Where do you get the money and how do you get started? Who do you hire first? Yeah, so it's not easy, Gray. Um, you can't just do these things willy-nilly. So, I spent a whole year mm -hmm. traveling all across the continent, but most of it within South Africa, trying to understand what people want. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people tend to know what they want and they, they fall in love with their product their idea they don't really take much time to listen um, so I spent about a whole year traveling all across the continent just talking to entrepreneurs uh, from all over I spent six months in Kenya working at a university uh, in, in, in Nairobi for a social entrepreneurship MBA program mm. so I was teaching entrepreneurs how to be more financially sustainable 
but in the process I learned more about what it means to be an entrepreneur in Africa. So mm -hmm. if you're a poultry farmer, a chicken farmer, if you run um, a coffee roasting business, if you work in uh, recycling, in plastics, in manufacturing, in something as little as um, farming, all kinds of farming. And these are entrepreneurs from Nigeria, Kenya, Cameroon, Sudan, Mauritius, all over. You just learn a lot about how small businesses work and run. The economic conditions, the government, the regulatory, the borrowing situations, the legal and compliance issues. And after a year of doing that with no pay whatsoever, it was on purpose, mm. I had this wealth of information, but more importantly, because I spent a year just listening and offering my advice and my time for free to, luckily I had savings from my Wall Street days that, that could allow me to do it. Mm. Um, people warmed up to the fact that I was there to just give and support. And then once you build a network of people that trust you mm. and don't look at you as a threat, but as you know, a partner, a mm. collaborator, a lot of things open. So when I came back to South Africa in 2011, started consulting to a few banks and insurance companies, so to ABSA, to All Mutual, a couple of funds. And then once you get to a point where, again, you've got some traction, mentoring, supporting small businesses with their fundraising, their partnerships, then slowly that morphed into um, me starting a, um, a fund advisory business called Ustart. Um, and that was a network of family offices, angel investors, um, individuals, individuals all over Europe that were looking to invest money into early stage African tech startups and high impact startups. So because I had quite a good knowledge about the African ecosystem, the VC and tech ecosystem, uh, they entrusted me with some of their funds to invest on their behalf. So I did that for about three and a half years. And we invested close to six million euros into early stage African tech companies. Right. After almost four years of doing that, I pivoted into understanding the importance of B2B partnerships and commercial relationships with large corporates to for be small more, for small businesses, for startups. Mm. Uh, to be equally important, if not more important than just funding. Right. So if you just fund a small business or a startup without giving them access to market or helping them with access to market, your, your funding is pretty much worthless. Okay. Right? So that's when um, I was approached by Barclays um, in, well, APSA at the time to run the first ever corporate venture capital accelerator program on the continent of Africa. It was called Barclays Tech Lab Africa. And uh, we, in a six, it was modeled on similar programs uh, in the US, uh, like Y Combinator and Techstars that I'm sure you've heard of, or 500 Startups. Yeah. And we, and we created the first ever corporate venture capital accelerator in Africa, based out of Cape Town. And we took 10 companies across FinTech and HealthTech, and we accelerated them over a three month period in Cape Town in partnership with Barclays. And just to prove how, how important corporate startup collaboration was, previous, prior to that, almost no corporates on the African continent had worked with startups, FinTechs or HealthTechs or InsurTechs before. And as a result of our three month program, which was sort of um, started in July, the selection period, and the program went from September through November. Um, we, we, we managed to raise more than $10 million in VC funding for the portfolio of 10 companies in the cohort. And it was strictly on the back of POCs, proof of concepts, yeah. pilots and commercial agreements that they had with Barclays. And it just goes to show that the moment you have strategic B2B partnerships with large corporations, even if it's just one, yeah. that severely or significantly mitigates your exposure right. to, uh, to risk yes. and VC funding or angel funding would come in after that. So on the back of that, 
We then ran a similar program for Alan Gray Orbis, the foundation. Yeah. In late 2016, we were approached by Startup Bootcamp, which is one of the top three accelerators in the world, and said, could you launch a multi-corporate backed accelerator mm -hmm. where not just one corporate, but four to five corporations across multiple industries work with you to identify and partner with the most innovative tech startups on the continent um, to create socioeconomic wealth through innovation. And, that, and that was a, uh, the foundation that started Bootcamp. So, um, what are the startups that are, have been very successful in your portfolio and which ones are you excited with? There are quite a lot. I mean, we've now invested in 20 companies and at the end of November this year, it will be 30. Mm. And I've personally invested in uh, uh, 12 of the top tech startups in Africa. So we're looking at you know, more than 40 mm. African tech startups that we've invested in. What are most of them doing? Uh, it's a broad range of things. Uh, there, there are a lot in financial services. So in payments, in uh, um, authentication, identification, chatbots, uh, digital KYC, money transfers, that's on the fintech side. We have quite a few companies in the health tech space, um, doctor patient booking platforms, uh, e-commerce, uh, travel tech, mm. just big data companies. We have uh, um, a couple of insure tech companies that help with faster onboarding of clients, claims, processing. Um, it, it, it's, it's a very diverse range well, of companies. Which one of these would you say, go check that one out, like mention two of them? Sure. I mean, the, the, the one company that I, that, that I, I mean, I shouldn't really prefer any of my companies because they're all good, <laughs> but Mpost is a company in Kenya. They were actually voted as one of the top eight tech startups in Africa by Forbes Africa last month. Okay. Mpost is a startup that, um, converts your mobile phone number into a legally verifiable uh, virtual post box. Okay. So less than 5% of Africans on the continent have a postal box. Definitely, yeah. Yep. So as a result, uh, they can never have mail delivered to them. And that includes not just physical mail, it's, it's, it's bank cards, it's insurance policies, it's parcels, it's packages. It's documentation, it's legal, it's university stuff, etc. So they have this unique patented technology that converts your phone number into a virtual post box. And they have a partnership with the government of Kenya and now the government of Uganda and Rwanda and they're, expa and they're expanding all over Africa. And what initially, and it, and it cost $3 a year mm. to get a virtual post box. But what started off as a B2C solution is now a B2B solution by right. large retailers, wholesalers, um, insurance companies, and financial service institutions that want to get access to distribution are using Mpost as a means for client acquisition. Yeah. So that's an incredible company. They're currently raising a $2 million Series A round. Um, so yeah, so they're one of our top companies. We have a digital bank in Nigeria called Kuda Bank, K-U-D-A Bank. Um, they're again taking the model of um, online banking, so no physical branches, uh, no banking fees, and just purely savings and transactional driven um, banking to another level. Um, we have a company called Digitech from Cote d'Ivoire, that helps large insurers and reinsurers with client acquisition purely through mobile phones. Right. So you have 950 million mobile phone users in Africa, all of whom use some form of mobile money through wallets, banking, chat, etc. And insurance companies historically have never used mobile as an onboarding channel. Mm -hmm. And Digitech allows you to not just onboard customers through mobile networks, but also process claims and collect premiums yeah. through mobile. So they're an incredible company, Digitech. Um, there's a company called Gotbot that's part of our first cohort in 2017 yeah. that builds artificial intelligence powered chatbots that optimize call centers 
so that make call centers more efficient by not taking away the need for human beings, yeah. but by making the process of human interactions more efficient. So instead of spending five hours at a call center, you're spending one hour as a call center worker mm -hmm. and freeing up time to do more efficient tasks and being right. trained yeah. digitally versus spending time at a call center in, 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 in what we call lazy time. Fantastic. I think yeah. we'll put all those uh, in the link. Uh, for those watching or listening, then you'll be able to check all those startups out. Uh, lastly, um, what are you excited about? by the end of the year? Do you have any plans in, in the next three, four months? Yeah, I mean, I'm, uh, if you look at the amount of venture capital activity in Africa, it's, it's, it's gone from about $30 million in 2011 to almost a billion, if not more than a billion dollars by the end of last year. Mm -hmm. And it's growing even more uh, the first half of 2019. Mm -hmm. So I'm really excited about the the work that we've done as Startup Bootcamp in accelerating companies and the ecosystem of venture capital funds in South Africa and all over the continent. I mean, we are very, very well networked in East Africa and West Africa. And the next sort of natural step is a Pan-African seed fund that focuses on funding early stage entrepreneurs that have gone through accelerators, incubators, um, and sort of startup support organizations that have their business models in, you know, in place, have pivoted, have customers, and are looking for bridging capital prior to their Series A rounds. And uh, I'm working on a fund, um, Pan-African fund, to help do sort of, to, to, to democratize the friends and family round of investments that come prior to a typical Series A investment. So that's sort of my next medium to, short to medium term focus is to is to is to work on the largest early stage fund for pan african seed ventures and um, very happy for people to get in touch with me on uh, on how they can be involved in that awesome uh, so we adding a, a job photo on our website where people can look into some exciting uh, opportunities that they can get involved in. Do you have any openings or are you looking to certain type, for certain type of people who can contribute into what you're doing now? Yes, I mean, so Startup Bootcamp on the accelerator side, as we grow, there are definitely opportunities that could come up. Um, our website is it's, 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 it's um, startupbootcamp.org is a global website and yeah. if you scroll down to the AfriTech part of it, there are you know, you, you can get a, a good overview of what Startup Bootcamp does. Um, and, you know, once once we look at what our strategies in 2020 with the fund and other um, activities, there, there are potential other opportunities for people across marketing, sales, fund management, you name it. Right. Um, my personal portfolio can be found on cactusadvisors.com, C-A-C-T-U-S, A-D-V-I-S-O-R-S, which is where I manage all our angel investments and, oh, okay. where, and, 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 and the fund. So cactus is your angel. Uh, cactusadvisors.com. Yeah. Yeah, okay. okay, awesome. Um, you guys can check that out. Thank you guys for watching. And yeah, if people want to get a hold of you, how do they do that on Twitter? Facebook? Yeah, Twitter, I'm Zach underscore cpt z a c h right underscore cpt um i'm also very accessible on linkedin uh and whatsapp for those that know me but i'm, I'm <laughs> you don't very, want to do that <laughs> yeah but uh email uh, zach z a c h at right. cactusadvisors.com c a c t u s a d v i s o r s dot com awesome or zach at startupbootcamp.org Awesome. Thank you, Zach. I appreciate your time. Thank man. you, Greg. I really appreciate it. Great. Cheers.